All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So a few housekeeping items before we kick off the series today. So uh, welcome to free training, how to build a cloud data platform. As a reminder, we will be running uh, four sessions this week, starting today through Friday. Each day, sessions will begin at 10 a.m. Pacific time. The Zoom link with which you use to join today's session will be the same link for the rest of the week, so uh, please join. We will be sending a recap email with a preview of the next day's content after each session. That email will include the on-demand version, so recorded version of today's session, as well as additional resources. So some of the sessions include notebooks and other items, so you'll be getting that as well as a complimentary code to access free Databricks Academy training. So that will all be in the recap email. So look for that later today or this evening. We also will be doing a live Q&A at the end of today's session. So at the bottom of your Zoom player, you should see a Q&A box. Feel free to ask Q, uh, questions throughout and we will try and get to as many as possible at the end. We will also be sending a follow-up survey in the next week or so. Uh, we would like to continue offering more training, so would love to hear um, how you found this series and what you would like to see more of. So today we have a lead Databricks instructor, Doug Bateman, who will be taking you through today's session and the rest of the week. So Doug, without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Welcome to How to Build a Big Data Cloud Platform for Business Intelligence and Machine Learning Applications. I'm your instructor, Doug Bateman. I'm a principal instructor here at Databricks, and I've been with the company since 2016. And in this time period, that is an eternity. And I help build the training program here at Databricks. In addition, I have roughly 20 plus years experience building and architecting large scale applications. But in addition to introducing myself here at Databricks, I'd also like to introduce myself as a person. Uh, I have some fun hobbies of sailing and rock climbing. I also enjoy snowboarding, although I'm not terribly good at it. And I even enjoy playing chess on occasion, but I'm not very good at that either. Uh, and fortunately, I have two wonderful children who are here with me right now, and they are being very quiet and allowing me to deliver this webinar to you today. So this webinar is part of a four part series where we're gonna dive into how to actually construct your big data cloud platform architecture for supporting your business intelligence and machine learning applications. Part one is really gonna focus on the architecture for constructing your data lake and what it takes to build a data lake that really yields high quality data and scales. And then when we dive into parts two, three, and four, we're gonna drop down from the architectural level into the coding layer and actually construct one of these systems. So for today's session, we're really gonna focus in that 10,000 foot view of what exactly your cloud data platform needs to look like to support terabytes of data and processing large volumes of ingest and updates and maintaining a clean set of data that could be used as a single source of truth to support this business intelligence, enterprise decision support systems, and machine learning. Just a little bit of background on Databricks as a company. Our vision is to accelerate innovation by unifying data science, engineering, and business. And what this really means is that we're trying to build a single platform that allows you to do the data engineering to clean and process and gather and maintain large data, and then feed that data downstream into your business intelligence and machine learning applications so that you can build predictive analytics and really get value out of your data. And so we have built what we consider a unified analytics platform. We are also the original creators of Apache Spark. We've also kicked off the Delta Lake project, which is a file format and data platform built on top of Apache Spark 
that really solves a number of the challenges and problems that come with big data, and this has been open sourced. And third, we are the open source creators of MLflow, or original creators, I should say, of MLflow. The reason I emphasize original creators is that these projects have taken on a life of their own as we have contributors now around the globe building systems and contributing back to the code base. So this seminar will very much focus on Delta Lakes as a platform. Delta Lakes is an open format based on Parquet that solves a number of the big challenges that people have when they try to build their data lake to support these enterprise decision support systems, including guaranteeing clean data, dealing with transactions, backfilling data that was historical into your pipeline, and integrating all of this into a large scalable system supported by Apache Spark. Now, when I talk about unified analytics, what I really mean is that you've got one core engine, Apache Spark, that can then support a whole variety of different types of workloads. So to begin with, we want to be able to ETL our data. So we're gonna pull data from a variety of different systems and ETL that data and bring it into what's known as a data lake. And a data lake is this profound technology here where it solves a number of the challenges that come with a data warehouse in the sense that a data warehouse often was very structured and a data warehouse requires a lot of upfront work to capture and clean the data before you can extract insights. And so what we find is that people often are reluctant to load data into their data warehouse because of all the upfront work required. With the data lake, we're able to simply capture exports of data from a whole variety of different systems and then do the cleaning downstream after we've loaded the data into this highly scalable file store that's made available with the cloud and bucket systems like Amazon S3 or Azure Blob Store that is cheap, scalable, high volume storage. So once we've got the data in our data lake and we ETL to really clean up our data, we then wanna be able to do exploratory data analysis. So we want an interactive environment that lets us do plots and queries. We wanna be able to feed that data into our machine learning pipeline so that we can do predictions and gain insights about trends and really extract business value that could really drive the business based on all this data that we're getting in this century. Additionally, we wanna integrate with streaming. Streaming allows us to process real data as it arrives, and it also provides a way to keep our data lake up to date. So as new data is coming in, we wanna not only ingest the new data, but update our downstream tables that contain clean data and reporting data and ensure that it's constantly updated as well as new data arrives. And last but not least, Apache Spark supports graph processing, another type of machine learning analytic, but where we're dealing with more social networks, anything with nodes, edges, and connections. So we've got the graph frames APIs in Spark that allow us to do this type of analytics. And if you look at the outside ring of this picture, this is the zoo of technologies that you would have to use if you weren't using Apache Spark. So there's a zoo of different technologies that deal with ETL, really great tools. There's a zoo of different technologies that have to do with machine learning, scikit-learn and SAS are very popular. There's a bunch of different technologies that come around doing business intelligence and exploratory data analytics, such as Tableau. And we've got a bunch of different technologies out there, Hive being a very popular one for building your data lakes. But what we've done here with the building a unified data platform is the idea that you have one tool that can perform this entire life cycle of doing all of these different types of workloads. And this is our vision here at Databricks. So Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for big data processing with built-in modules for streaming, SQL, machine learning, and graph processing. And it started out back in 2009, and so really not that long ago, just a little over 10 years ago, as a research project. And since then, it has taken the world by storm as it's become one of the de facto technologies for dealing with big data processing at scale. 
And a big reason for that is the high performance and throughput you get with a system like Spark. So in order to really just get this big picture of Spark, we want to ask ourselves this question. How would you process huge, massive job sizes with petabytes and terabytes of data? And to answer that question, let's make an analogy to M&Ms. Suppose I came to you and I just got, gave you a small bag of M&Ms and I asked you how many green M&Ms there are. Well, you might open the bag and start counting the green M&Ms. But now let's say I go to one of these big box stores or I get one of these special deals after Easter and I can buy a whole tub of M&Ms and I ask you how many green M&Ms are there? Well, at this point, counting them by your hand would take you a very long time and isn't scalable. So what you'd likely do is bring a number of your friends into the room and you divide up the M&Ms amongst all the friends. You'd each grab a batch of M&Ms and you'd start counting. And if one of the friends leaves, you would try to get the results that that friend has worked on so far. And then you would reassign the rest of the work to somebody else. And this is exactly how Spark scales. So when we're dealing with Apache Spark, we're really talking about a driver. That's you. This is where your application runs. And the driver serves as this coordinator of the workload and then assigns tasks to the executor machines, each of which have a thread pool and a number of CPUs on each machine that are capable of processing big data. So each executor will grab a portion of the data, start counting the green M&Ms, and then send back to the driver its share of the results. So the driver coordinates, the executors do the work. And in fact, often the executors are reading in the files and writing out the results to disk without ever even needing to send the results directly to the driver. And in this way, we gain huge amounts of scalability. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started and talking about the architecture for building your big data pipeline. So to do that, I'm going to go into some of the self-paced learning materials that we have available for you here at Databricks. We're going to look at this case, the fundamentals of the Delta Lake, which really focuses on this new data management paradigm. So if we were to go back to say the late 1980s, data warehouses were coming out as a new field that is revolutionary in terms of the types of insights that we could get from our data. We would extract data from our various operational data sources and various external tables as well. We would do an ETL and we would create this enterprise data model. And then from there, we'd create these downsampled versions called data marts that could then be used by various departments to do your business intelligence and reporting. And people would draw this into systems like SAS to do data science as well. And this worked really well, but as data started getting bigger and bigger and elastic scaling became the big challenge, we've moved in the 2000s towards what we call the data lake, which is built around the idea of scalable cloud computing. So in a data lake, we're gonna relax a number of the constraints that used to come with the data warehouse. For example, we're just gonna capture the data in all the different systems in the format that that system makes it available. So rather than having to do a really complicated ETL up front before I can get any value, we're gonna allow various systems to simply export their data in a structured or semi-structured or unstructured way. So instead of being flat tables, it could be JSON data, hierarchical data, all sorts of different formats. And we're going to defer any type of cleaning work that would have been needed to get insights in our data warehouse and really just focus on capturing the data in the first place. And this is important because the process of cleaning the data up front often became unscalable when it came to your data warehouse. People would say, I would love to get this data into my data warehouse, but it takes so much time to design my enterprise data model and do the data cleansing that it's often months before I get any type of value. 
And as the amount of data that we're collecting goes, people found that they just weren't saving the data. And then months later, they would go, I want to run this query, but oh shoot, we never captured the data in the first place. And so this is really where the data lake shines. It captures the data in a large, scalable cloud system like Azure Blob Store or Amazon S3. And we've captured the data. And once the data has been captured, we do still want to be able to get insights in that data. So then the data lake will do an ETL process, but an ETL on a subset of that data to populate our data marts. And so the beauty is I'm getting the data that I need to do my reports, but I'm not limited in the amount of data that I can collect. So companies are able to collect petabytes and terabytes of data, have it available, and then do the data cleansing as needed to get today's insights. And when you have a new use case, you can go back to the original raw data and extract more. And this is incredibly powerful. It solves a big piece of the scaling problem by allowing you to collect data before you know how it's going to be used. And in addition, we can read that data in and feed it into our data science and machine learning tools as well. So this is our data lake. And in fact, we often started with this uh, Hadoop really brought about the data lake. Now, the cloud data platform goes beyond this in the sense that we really want to take all the power of the data lake and marry it with the power of the cloud. That infinite elastic compute, that infinite storage, not truly infinite, but huge amounts of storage that are available in the cloud, and be able to scale this out even further. So we've just talked a little bit about data warehouses and that long history of being our support for building business intelligence applications and doing decision supports. And we've been able to scale our data warehouses by using massively parallel processing architectures so that we can handle much larger sizes, but they always have this fundamental challenge of being a structured data system and requiring a lot of upfront ETL work. And additionally, they often can be quite expensive, and so when it comes to scaling, they may not necessarily be cost efficient. And that's where data lakes kicked in, as this repository for raw data that comes in a whole variety of different formats. So some systems will provide you JSON data, some systems are gonna provide you XML data, some systems are gonna dump CSV data, and eventually you want to turn this into a fast queryable format, which is where Parquet and Delta Lakes comes in. And one of the challenges that we had with data lakes is that while they were suitable for storing data, the traditional data lake lacked a number of critical features. For example, transactions, asset transactions, and enforcement of data quality. So you want to be able to say, I'm going to read data from the raw and I'm going to create some higher quality tables that are more easily consumed. And I want to be able to keep those tables up to date, but the lack of asset transactions, that is the ability to do all or nothing, causes problems where programmers have to deal with, how do I go back and fix a failed job or partially complete data? And how do I deal with data quality problems or backfilling my data? And this is the challenge that a lot of people had with data lakes and where Delta Lakes and the cloud data platform come in to help. And then once we've got that, we then want to start building a whole variety of different applications. For example, we can do SQL analytics with our business intelligence tools. We might even want to connect a tool like Tableau to be able to query data from our data lake and do the types of visualizations we'd like to do. We maybe want to build real-time monitoring using streaming and building real-time dashboards or we may want to do data science with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, a common approach that people have used for these types of platforms is they start with having a data lake underneath the hood. That is, we're going to just capture the data from all the different systems as exports in whatever format that system makes available, whether it's a CSV file or a JSON file or some other export type. And then they took and they ETL data from the data lake into the data warehouse. So they would 
build a data lake, then they would build a data warehouse, and the data warehouse gave them the ability to build their star schemas and provide high throughput query support to support their business analytics. And then they had to use some other tool for streaming and a different tool for dealing with their time series and graphical databases. And this is what we talked about as the pain of not having a unified data platform. So a cloud data platform seeks to solve a lot of these problems by providing unified analytics and the elastic compute capability of the cloud with low cost storage and scalable compute resources. So here are some really key features of a cloud data platform. Number one, storage is decoupled from compute. What do we mean by that? Well, you want truly elastic, scalable storage. So when you run in the cloud, we don't want to be trying to keep the storage limited to the local computers because then I have to constantly copy the storage every time I add more machines. But the cloud provides us huge, scalable, cheap storage in the form of S3 or Azure Blob Store. We want to take advantage of that. Not only do we want to take advantage of this cheap storage in the cloud, we also want to make sure that we're using open source formats, tools, and processing engines so that we don't have what's known as data gravity, where data is locked into a specific system. We want this data lake to be accessible by many different systems and easily input by many different systems by supporting a whole variety of different file formats, not just the tables that are in the data warehouse. We also want to support a variety of different data types, for example, unstructured data or semi-structured JSON data or your traditional tabular structured data. We also need to be able to support a variety of workloads, including SQL analytics, data science and machine learning. We need to be able to support transactions to be able to guarantee all or nothing updates to the data. And we want to be able to keep that data up to date using streaming. So data coming in in real time and insights coming out in real time. So what does this look like when we use Apache Spark? Well, on top of Apache Spark, we're going to use this technology known as a Delta Lake. Delta Lake was announced as an open source project roughly one year ago at Spark Summit in 2019. And it's a technology for building robust data lakes inside of that cloud data platform. So it adds to the data lake a layer to provide the tools that we need for data consistency, like transactional updates, backfilling of data, data consistency guarantees, etc. So what exactly does that mean? Well, a Delta Lake, which is the Delta technology added to make a better data lake, consists first and foremost of the tables. This is where we're going to store our data. So a table is really going to be kept in files, Delta files, which is just an improvement on the Farquet file format. And then we're going to make those files available to our platform by registering that file as a table that we can then query in SQL. And that file has a transaction log that constantly says, what is the latest state of the table? So that we, with a transaction log, we're able to do atomic updates to the table and roll back updates or access older versions of the table as necessary. So Delta Lakes, by design, use the Parquet file format underneath, but they add this transaction log to the file, allowing us to get this type of robustness that's necessary to get true value out of our data lake. So Parquet files themselves, if you're not familiar with them, are a really good state-of-the-art format for storing both hierarchical and tabular data. So structured and semi-structured data, and they're very, very fast for querying. And it's an Apache open source project. Parquet actually is its own project separate from Apache Spark, and Apache Spark uses it. And it's designed for maximum efficiency, meaning if you've got 500 columns, it's only going to read the columns that are needed. And the way it does that is rather than storing the data row by row, rather than storing the data row by row, it stores the data column by column. This way, if I'm searching for rows, for example, where the first name is Doug, 
I can quickly skim all the rows, but only in the first name column and identify which rows I'm interested in. So when it comes time to read the other columns, I can quickly skip to the parts of those columns that I'm interested in. So it's column oriented versus row oriented. Very powerful. So this is the underlying file format, the delta tables. Now on top of that, we need a query engine that's capable of reading those files and giving us useful insights and results. And this is where Apache Spark kicks in. Apache Spark will be the query engine that's used to read these delta tables. So with your traditional data warehouse, the data warehouse contained the data inside of it. But when we deal with the cloud, we wanna separate storage and compute. So the storage layer is gonna be these delta tables stored in S3 or Amazon Blob or Azure Blob Store. And the delta table or Apache Spark is then going to be reading those delta tables and providing the scalable compute and query. Now, a common question people have is they say, hey, wasn't one of the big things of Hadoop that it co-located the data with the machines? And this indeed was one of the things that they tried to do with Hadoop was to group the data and the machines together for faster reads. But this created scalability problems. When we move to the cloud, we can solve that problem differently. We can use the cloud storage to be this highly scalable storage architecture and allow the cloud to cache that data. And when we go to do the compute, we can pull that data from the cloud storage and then cache it on the local compute machines. So we get all of the performance of local data access due to our caching layer, but we don't get the cost of having to constantly deal with backup copies of data because we have the data stored in the cloud in a highly reliable fault tolerant S3 or Azure Blob Store type system. So this is really nice. We have this optimization engine that does those queries. And then we've got the Delta Lake storage layer. So the Delta Lake storage layer itself is what I've been describing. There's the tables, which are the files, and then there's the storage layer where we put those files, whether it's Azure Data Lake Store, Azure Blob Store, Amazon's S3, Simple Storage Service. This is the scalable system that's going to allow us to store the data. And then the last component, which is really critical, is this Delta architectural design. And this is the part I'm really gonna hammer home today this Delta architecture that allows us to capture the raw data in a scalable fashion and then create easier, cleaner tables that allow make are used as input to our machine learning and to our data analytics. So we're gonna have layers of cleanliness in our pipeline so that we're capturing everything but creating clean data that can feed our business intelligence and machine learning applications. Let's see here. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. So the Delta tables, what are we exactly talking about when we talk about a Delta table? So a Delta table is going to be our files. They're going to be kept in our storage layer. We're going to register it with as a table name so that we can use SQL to query it. And again, that transaction log that helps us version that table and know that what we're querying is the latest good version of the table, and I'm not reading any dirty data until it's ready for use. So this looks like I've got my operational data store. This is all the different places I'm ETLing from. So I might be ETLing from a traditional database. I might be doing data exports from Salesforce. I might be doing data exports from the Internet of Things, where I'm collecting files from all sorts of different machines. And I'm going to ETL this into my data lake. And I'm going to be doing atomic writes into the system and banning any data that is potentially corrupt. And then I'm going to use Databricks's workspaces as this opportunity to launch a cluster that in turn knows how to query those files. So I'm ETLing data into files that are stored in cheap storage. And then I'm running Spark on Databricks in order to be able to read those files and gain insights. 
and then the end users in turn are using Apache Spark. So we've already talked about most of these layers here. We've talked about one of the ideas being the Delta Lake storage layer. That's your scalable cloud storage. And now I'd like to drill in a little bit into this concept of the Delta architecture. So the Delta architecture is what makes it possible to get the best of the data warehousing world and the best of the data lake world. In the sense that we're gonna be bringing data from all sorts of different external systems. And the job of the first layer is just to pull the data from all the different systems and put it into one place. So that's the idea of the bronze or really what we call our raw table. We're bringing in the data as it was exported from these other systems. So that means that there's a lot of heterogeneity. There's not a lot of schema enforcement at this stage. The data might be in the form of JSON files. It might be in the form of CSV files, but we're gonna bring the data into our data lake so that if I ever need to go and get data that I didn't capture and use because I didn't think I needed it, and later I discover I do, I have the original source data where I can pull that information from. So this has all of the information, but it's not been cleaned up and put into a user-friendly format. So the next step is to take that raw data and turn it into something that is easier to query. So I'm going to extract from the raw data useful tabular data. I'm going to make tables, I'm gonna do data cleansing, I'm gonna clean up this raw data and create something that looks more like your traditional data warehouse tables. So, oops, the silver tables are those cleaned query tables. Then, once I've gotten these clean tables, I wanna be able to do reporting. So I wanna be able to build potentially OLAP cubes, or I wanna be able to build aggregate statistics. You know, after I've collected information about all the cars out there and how, what their gas mileage and where they've been driving, first I'm gonna put them into a nice table that describes the cars and where they're going, and then I'm gonna do some reporting. How many of these cars were in California? How many of these cars were in New York City? What was the average gas mileage? The type of information that in turn can be fed into reporting systems or used to train an AI model. So I'm building this data pipeline where I'm going from lots of data that's dirty to lots of data that's clean to summary data that's easier to consume. This is the Delta architecture. We're gonna be working with this architecture throughout this four part series. Now, to understand what the Delta Lake really brings uh, beyond the traditional data lake, these are the three key things we wanna highlight. Number one, separation of compute and storage. And for the people who did Hadoop, this feels heretical because Hadoop was all about bringing the storage to where you did the compute. But by separating compute and storage, we're able to store a lot of data have elastic scalable storage and elastic scalable compute. And then we use really intelligent caching to cache the data as it's being used. So I'm pulling into the local machines, the data that I'm actually interested in and caching relevant parts of the data. So I get full performance and scalability and I don't lose any of the performance gains that are available by having local access to data, but I don't lose the scalability that's available as well. So in this system, Apache Spark does the computation on the data, but it is not the storage layer. So Spark is not a database. Spark is a query engine. The data is stored in files. Those files are stored in your scalable cloud storage. And Apache Spark is the compute layer that then knows how to go about reading it. So that's the first step, separation of compute and storage made possible by the cloud. Then we move to reliable data lakes. So what do we mean by that? So with reliability, we wanna be able to 
add in things that are necessary to keep the data in a known and clean state. So number one, we want to be able to have guaranteed transactions. Updates are either fully made or they're not made at all. You will not see half made updates. And you want to be able to enforce constraints on the cleanliness of your data and have assertions that must be maintained at all times. And then lastly, structured streaming. So structured streaming is a feature inside of Spark that allows us to work on data in a near real time basis as it arrives. So this would allow me to go back to this bronze, silver, gold model, but accept data as it's coming in and store it not just in the bronze layer, but constantly be updating the clean data and the reports as new data arrives. And we don't want to have to rerun a nightly batch job to keep these systems up to date. Rather, we want to be able to look at what's new and do only the incremental amount of work necessary to keep these downstream tables up to date. So we're going to integrate this platform with streaming processing to ensure that the data is flowing through my pipeline in an efficient way where I process deltas and changes rather than the entire data set. And I'm able to keep my reports up to date then as new data arrives. So structured streaming support. This replaces what some of you guys may have heard of as the Lambda architecture. So let's step back for a moment and talk about what is our goal when we're building this data lake. And the answer is a single source of truth. So if I'm building a business intelligence system or I'm trying to do machine learning, I want one place to go to get my data from all the different systems across my enterprise. I want to be able to query databases. I want to be able to query log files. I want to be able to query dumps from Internet of Things devices. I want to be able to join data across the entire business. And this is petabytes of data. And I don't want to have to deal with going to lots of different systems every time I want to get an insight. So the idea is to ingest the data into your Delta Lake and have the Delta Lake be the single source of truth for downstream consumers of information. That is your data scientists doing machine learning or your, anal or your business analysts who are doing business intelligence type queries. So this idea of a single source of truth is something that's been around for a very long time in the world of data warehouses. The idea that you wanted your data warehouse to represent this dump of information from all the different systems across your enterprise. And that then becomes this enterprise decision support system that is used to help extract benefits and insights from the data. Uh, so the traditional one was built in a data warehouse that was run on premises. Now we actually have cloud oriented data warehouses. Or we could use instead of a data warehouse, we could actually use a data lake. So, but the goal, the problem that we're solving is still the same. Whether I'm using a data lake, a data warehouse, or some other technology, our goal is the same, and that is to provide a single source of truth for all of the different applications that are downstream and consuming information about what's happening in my business. So, one really important distinction here when we talk about this is the difference between online transaction processing and online analytics processing. So transaction processing is where I'm, for example, operating a store and I'm having people change records, individual records on an ongoing basis. So this is driving the data input type applications where the users, for example, interacting on an Amazon shopping cart or people are pulling up a database system and updating consumer records or maybe the software that's driving my self-driving car. This is the live data in the field. It's designed for constantly changing data. And these are designed to ensure that as my data is constantly changing, I'm able to provide those strong transactional guarantees. 
But then I want to be able to move that data into an enterprise decision support system so that I can be getting my business intelligence insights. And this is where the data lake fits in. I'm capturing data from all these source systems into my single source of truth that is the enterprise decision support system. Say so many operational data stores that feed into one enterprise decision support system. So many different databases that are transactional and they're doing these dumps into my enterprise decision support system. And we'd like that to be a data lake because of its low cost and high scalability. So here's a picture. I've got data from lots of different systems being carried into that single source of truth that is the enterprise decision support system, which then makes data available for business analytics purposes. Here's a different picture that I think helps a little bit, contrasting the difference between your operational data stores that are doing transaction processing from your data warehouse, which is consuming data. Now, somebody just asked a really good question here. He says, all right, I thought you said the idea is that you wanted to build transactions into your data lake. So what we're really talking about is when I read data from these operational data stores, I want to A, make sure that I import the data in a consistent way. So I'm bringing in data and it's never half written. And B, when I bring in this data, I want to make sure that I can keep it up to date. So I want to A, make sure that it's atomically written, and B, that I have a way of capturing changes and keeping this data up to date. And this is where the Delta Lake power is going to come in. So let's go back to this picture of the enterprise support system. We've got our operational data stores. This is where the data is coming from. So the operational data store is going to be your day-to-day -day systems, your databases, your websites, your mobile apps, your self-driving cars, your Internet of Things. It's there and it's formatted to meet the needs of those operations. We're then going to ingest it into our atomic store. That is our data lake. This big enterprise decision support system, we're bringing in that data and we're going to be capturing it in our data lakes as a single source of truth. So it's got all the values of any data and we can look at how it's changed over time. And the atomic data store is the most granular data. It's fully integrated across all these different systems. It's basically a single dumping ground of all information across the enterprise. We then want to clean that data up and make it accessible to individual communities of business users. And that's the idea of the data mart. The data mart being really designed around the needs of a specific team, department, or use case. And this is in turn updated on a regular basis whenever new data is loaded into the atomic store we want to be able to update our data marts so that individual business users can in turn consume it. So let's take a look at some examples. Let's say we're looking at credit score. The operational data might be your individual credit score and the systems that are tracking your credit score. The atomic data then would be not just your current credit score, but you can actually have the dumps over time of your credit score and how it's changed. So it's this larger encompassing historical view of data, not just from your system, in fact, but from other systems as well. So it's this historical record versus the current state of things. We then can build departmental data reports. So these are some aggregations. For example, how are these things changing by month? What percentage of my customers have an A credit score or better? So, you know, an excellent credit score or better. 
And then eventually you have the individual who's making these queries into that data mart trying to get the information. Now, if you've been working with data warehouses for a while, you may say, oh, this looks extremely familiar. This is exactly like what's been taught with data warehouses. The difference is that we want to be able to extract this to a higher scalability, larger amount of data at lower cost. And this is where the cloud data, excuse me, cloud data platform comes in by offering greater scalability and lower cost than your traditional data warehouse. You can in turn actually integrate this and combine it with a data warehouse by using the data lake for the atomic store. And then you can either build these departmental stores using data lakes, or if you need, you could build it using a data warehouse. So they can be synergistic in the sense that your data lake can feed your data warehouse, or it can actually replace the need for a data warehouse, depending on your specific business case. We do see that over time, the need for the data warehouse will be diminished, but currently, as of the state of the art right now, there are definitely some benefits around data warehouses. I see some chat messages here where people have been asking about the difference between the data lake and the data warehouse. So the data warehouse being this more monolithic system compared to the data lake, which is much more scalable because we separated compute and storage, but we can still get some of the benefits of the data warehouse at the departmental level because then we can build our star schemas and our indexed tables and get high throughput and scalability. But it's absolutely the case that over time, we think the industry is moving in a direction where the data lake can actually replace a lot of the type of load used by a traditional data warehouse. So just kind of a little quiz question for those of you who are watching right now. Consider each of these different types of systems. At which layer would it be associated? So let's start out with your MySQL database. So a typical use for a MySQL database would be for transactions. So MySQL, it's a nice open source database, and typically it would be our transactional layer. So we would call that our operational data store. It's the source of the information that we're going to populate into our data lake. Then we're going to want to read that data into our object storage. So this in turn would be that atomic layer where we're capturing all the information into our data lake. Let's see here. What else? By the way, you're, you can also actually do cleaned data. As I mentioned, you could actually not only capture the data, but you can in turn build reports and save those as well into your data lake. So it could actually be at either layer. All right, Kafka. So Kafka is a streaming engine. It provides data real time as it's made available from your devices. So Kafka as a streaming source is providing data to our system and it would be part of this operational layer. Now, let's go down a little further. Where does the data warehouse fit in? So your typical data warehouse here in a traditional system would actually be storing all of the data and it would be filling the role of the atomic layer. But later, you could actually use it to build these reporting tables, the clean data that's used by departments and individuals for querying and it can also, in that case, be your uh, departmental layer. So the data warehouse traditionally filled both of these. But what we find is that they have scalability problems and cost problems when they serve this ETL role. So we would rather use the data lake rather than the data warehouse to fill the role of the atomic layer. And for some customers, we would rather use the data lake for other customers, we may still use a data warehouse. And then lastly, gathering insights. That is the analytics itself. That's at the individual layer. The people writing and running the queries. That's the end of this pipeline and the one that we're going to really dive deep into in the fourth session in the seminar series. We're going to start by building these two layers in sessions two and three, 
and then we're going to build the individual layer in session four. Now, there's some really useful terminology when it comes to really understanding these data lake systems. Um, Bill Iman, or Inman is really considered the founder of the data warehouse. And a lot of these data warehousing ideas very much are going to pull into this world of a cloud data processing uh, big data system for supporting BI and ML. And the reason for that is we're really taking those ideas and simply replacing the heavyweight data warehouse with a much more scalable lightweight architecture of the data lake. So what are some of the ideas that Bill Edman taught us? Well, number one, we have an ETL process that loads the operational data into our enterprise decision support system, that is our atomic data. So operational data gets loaded in to our data warehouse or our data lake. We then have another process that loads data from that shared data lake into the individual departmental level, the reporting tables that are used to gain business insights and machine learning. And then the end users, in turn, are going to be querying those tables to gain further insight. So let's go back up, or actually let's go down and look at how that maps to our gold, silver, bronze. So we're going to ETL the data. First, we're going to capture it. That's this idea of the bronze raw data. Some people call this extract, load, transform. I'm going to load the data into my data lake here. Then I'm going to clean it. These are my silver tables. And then I'm going to produce these reports. And these are my gold tables. So raw or load tables, cleaned query tables, and gold reporting tables. And the gold tables are the ones that really form our departmental layer. And then we want our end users being able to query those gold tables. And on occasion, they might drop to the silver table. And if there's data that's just not been loaded into my data warehouse yet, on very rare occasion, they may need to go back to this archive to pull data that had not been loaded into these other systems, but thank goodness you still have it. And that's one of the beauties of this design is that I can keep so much historical information around. So this Inman idea, some of the benefits of the data traditional on-premise data warehouse Remember this design now, we could do it in a number of different ways. We could do it with your traditional on-premises data warehouse. Some of the benefits of that had to deal with highly optimized and tuned hardware and software, as well as the ability to build high-performance data indexing to speed up my queries. Now, these really tight couple of hardware and software allow for high throughput and performance, and we also get some really massively parallel processing that allows for scalability. And the other benefit is that it's a well-established technology. But they had a number of challenges, the traditional data warehouse. Number one, they weren't built natively for the cloud, at least not initially. There are a number of data warehouses now that have been reconstructed and redesigned to be cloud native. But a lot of the traditional ones that people have on premise really weren't designed for the cloud. And as such, they're not elastic and they can't easily be scaled up or scaled down. They also have a lot of problem with data duplication. This idea that uh, in order to get a lot of the benefits, I'm constantly copying the data and it's very hard to keep clean, which really makes it difficult to have that single source of truth. But I would say the biggest challenges with these traditional data warehouses has to do with this notion of data gravity. Data gravity is how hard it is to move data from one system to another. So the highest data gravity is the data that's in the actual source area, your, your operational data store. The 
database, the MySQL database, or the car itself. Getting the data out of those systems is the hardest. But then moving it into your data warehouse, it's still going to be in some proprietary format inside of your data warehouse. And it has to be in a form compatible with that data warehouse. And this is what we call vendor lock-in and data gravity. It's hard to move the data free. We would rather build our system based on open source standards and file formats that can be read, read from and written to a whole variety of different software systems. Another pain point of your traditional data warehouse is that they really only work with structured data. And a lot of these operational systems did exports in the form of XML and JSON, which didn't immediately consume well and fit well into your traditional enterprise data warehouse. And last but not least, expense. These traditional data warehouses are very expensive to build. They're very expensive to license. They require a lot of computing. They require a lot of man investments. They require a lot of upfront loading. You have to have a dedicated database administrator. You have to shut it down for various updates. They can be very expensive propositions. And I would encourage anybody watching this to share in the chat your experiences with a traditional data warehouse. Now, these on-prem data warehouses have recently gone through a revolution where people have tried to re-architect them for the cloud. And this provides this cloud native approach to dealing with a cloud data warehouse. So there's a lot of benefits here. Number one, you get the benefit of separation of compute and storage. You can add new computers or new disk as necessary quickly and efficiently and scalably. They're optimized for high query throughput. So while the data ETL may be time consuming, the queries themselves on that data are very, very fast. And they provide us a way as well to archive the historical data, which is really, really nice because I can keep those initial raw ingest files. And because I'm running in a cloud platform, I don't require the same amount of work required to set up and install and maintain because that's handled for me by my cloud vendor. But even these had some challenges. For example, data gravity. I'm still in a format that is linked to that cloud data warehouse, and it's a vendor-specific proprietary format on disk. We're also still limited to structured data. What about our JSON and hierarchical data? Now, we have seen some insurgence of NoSQL databases to try to provide some flexibility around this. We also have this idea that we're sending queries to these systems, but there's not a lot of transparency into how they're actually processing our queries, which makes it very hard to tune and optimize. And because the data in the Delta Lake only exists as raw data, it's not queryable. Or if I clean it, then I have the problem of keeping my clean data in sync with the raw data. So how does this in turn get solved by the direction that we're going to be going in this course, the cloud data platform? And the answer is we're going to design it using data lakes instead of a data warehouse. So we're going to try to reduce the role or potentially eliminate the role of the data warehouse by using open source standard file formats and a scalable processing engine like Apache Spark. So Spark is going to do the ETL processes. We're going to store the data in an open source file format in our cloud. You'll be able to read and write to these files from a multitude of different systems, not just your data warehouse. And where you desire to have the performance of your data warehouse, you can build these departmental data sources tuned specifically for that data warehouse, which is much cheaper because they're not storing everything anymore. They're only storing the highly frequently queried data. Or we use the cloud itself, the cloud data platform, 
and we simply use Spark to fill the role of doing those queries, and we don't use a data warehouse at all. So some of the benefits, again, separation of compute and storage. Infinite in the sense that they're constantly adding more capacity, so you really don't need to be worried about running out of space because you can always ask the cloud provider to provide you more capacity and higher quotas. We're able to get the best aspects of a data warehouse that's running in the cloud, so we don't have to deal with DBAs, and we can get high query throughput and concurrent reads. Our cost is much lower. It's the least expensive option because I'm using the cheap cloud storage and open source technologies that are highly scalable. And you're only paying for compute when the compute is done. And it's got the lowest data gravity because all the files are stored in formats that can be read by other systems because they're open source standard. We get high data throughput. In fact, we get much higher data throughput than we can in many other systems simply because of the high scalability of the multi -parallel, massively parallel processing that Apache Spark makes available. And we're not limited to the flat tabular data structures. Parquet supports hierarchical data. We can also work with JSON data and other types of file formats. And best of all, we can mix batch and streaming so that we can use streaming to keep our data continuously up to date, which is something that's always been the challenge in a traditional data warehouse. But there are challenges. Number one, the data warehouse is designed for high concurrency on the reads, the cloud data platform that is, has high concurrency on the reads but when it comes to multiple people doing writes to the warehouse at the same time, it doesn't necessarily scale the same. So what you really want to do is have one or two jobs that are writing to the data warehouse instead of having lots of small transactional updates. So it's optimized for reads. It's not optimized for writes, but you can still get very efficient writes as long as you've got very carefully considered nightly jobs or streaming jobs doing those updates. Another challenge of a traditional or the cloud data platform right now is that they do tend to run a little bit slower on the queries than a data warehouse. And the reason for that is that a data warehouse has more indexing. So they have indexes that allow for faster query throughput. And one of the areas that we see a huge opportunity for growth in cloud data platforms coming in the next two years is to build some of those data warehouse type capabilities into your cloud data platform so that it runs faster by having higher throughput and lower latency queries. Another challenge that people have had when they try to unify batch and streaming without using Delta Lakes, so they're just a traditional data warehouse, is they had to rely on something known as the Lambda architecture, where they wrote the logic once for batch and again for streaming, which, tedious, which was tedious and time consuming. And so this is where Delta Lakes is going to really solve that problem because we will not need to use the Lambda architecture. And then the other downside, of course, is that you've got to learn Spark. Now, of course, with any of the platforms that we've described, you need to learn the platform. And that's what we're going to be doing in the next three parts of our series. So let's bring it home right now so that we can get to a Q&A session. Fundamentals of a Delta Lake. So a Delta Lake is built on the same architecture that we've been discussing, where we're trying to build an enterprise decision support system that reads in our data cleans it and makes it available to these departmental users to do AI analytics or machine learning. So some of those challenges that traditional systems before we introduced data lakes had to deal with was number one, reliability, poor quality or corrupt data, inconsistent views when you're trying to read from streaming, duplication of logic with Lambda architecture, and storage issues in terms of what happens if multiple people are doing writes at the same time. 
how do we deal with transactionality and isolation? We had scaling problems as lots of different readers are trying to read too many small files or lots of writers are trying to update data at the same time. So this is where the delta lake, and again, the lambda architecture problem that we've mentioned, this is where the delta lake is going to solve these problems. Number one, by providing systems for guaranteeing clean quality data and a consistent view, same way we do code for batch is the way we're gonna do our code for streaming. So I don't need to write my logic twice and it's easy to optimize. So here we're talking about clean quality data with transactional updates so we can support simultaneous writes with true isolation, as well as if a write fails, we'll roll back. Schema enforcement to avoid inserting bad records. The ability to access historical versions of tables for audit purposes. So for example, if the tables changed and I wanna see what it looked like yesterday when a machine learning job ran, I can and the ability to process data with exactly once semantics. So I know that I'm not processing this record twice. Really, really important. Number two, I want to be able to provide a consistent view across batch and streaming workloads. So if I can make the code look the same, whether I'm running it as a nightly batch job or a streaming job running every few minutes, then I can guarantee that my system is up to date at whatever interval I need, and it's easy to switch from one paradigm to the other. And last but not least, we want our Delta Lake to be really easy to adopt, optimized for the cloud, and to use Delta to avoid data lock-in because Delta Lake is an open source file format and platform. So Delta being built on top of Parquet and being an open source project, you know that your data is always available to you and your concerns over adopting a platform with high data gravity are greatly reduced. So there's a lot of little features that are gonna be added into this, including scalability. We wanna be able to work with, Delta Lakes wants to be able to work with your on-premise systems like Hadoop, as well as in Spark, or if you're using other technologies like Athena, absolutely, you can use Delta Lakes with these different platforms. And yet, it's fully compatible and works inside of Spark. It's open source, reducing your lock-in. You can even run it on your local laptop. Wonderful, very, very efficient. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Again, this bronze, silver, gold platform. So we're going to read data into our data lake. This is the operational store. We're going to read data into the data lake using raw data. This could be JSON data. It could be Parquet data. It could be any file format you want. We read it into our data lake. We're then going to extract from it and clean the data producing tables that are easier to query using SQL. So this is the job often of the data engineer is to ingest the data, put a copy into the big data lake repository, clean it so that we have a system that can serve as our enterprise support layer, that single source of truth that we've been talking about. And then again, read those tables and produce are reporting tables. These can be your star schemas, or they can be just simple aggregations. How many people bought this product in this state this month? And then we can feed that into our machine learning pipeline. This is the architecture of the future that we are gonna be building as part of this series. So we talked first about the bronze layer. This is the raw layer. Then we talked about the silver layer. This is the query tables. It's normalized or mostly normalized. It's cleaned. All the schemas have been enforced. You know the data is easy to query. And then your gold layer being those aggregates. So 
So now you have a complete architecture that supports this whole process. And there's going to be various commands that we're going to be looking at as we build out our system during the seminar series. We're going to be inserting the data and updating the data in this bronze layer. We're then going to actually be able to do cleaning using delete commands and merge and update commands as well. In the silver layer, this is going to be keeping our data clean. And eventually, we're going to want to be doing updates to the data in our gold layer, where we have our clean data. We're going to be building this out this series. So I really look forward to having you come back and working with us. Now, in order to bring us to the point where we're ready for our next session, I'm going to do just a very short code demo of Apache Spark. Let me transition over to the code demo. Got my code demo launched and ready to go here. And then we're going to go into some Q&A. And um, I have been noticing there's a lot of really good questions. And some of the TAs have been helping to curate those questions. And I really want to get to those. But first, I want to go ahead and do this uh, demo of Apache Spark. Now, we are going to be looking specifically at the Delta Lakes components in the next two sessions. So in this piece, I'm going to really just be focusing on Spark itself and show how you're able to do some of the data in just in Spark and unify this whole idea of a unified analytics platform in this demo. Whereas in the next session, we're going to be diving much deeper into how to use Delta Lakes. And it'll also answer a number of the questions that we've had today, but I definitely plan to reserve time to dive into some of your questions because I've, I've seen some really good ones popping up in the chat, uh, both in the Q&A area and in the chat. And if uh, you haven't submitted your question to the Q&A area, please do so because I'm going to be drawing from those. Now, let's come over here. I've just got a short demo that's going to really demonstrate the capabilities of Spark itself as a unified analytics engine so that you can then see why there's value in actually bringing your data into this environment using the idea of a data lake. So we're setting ourselves up to be learning data lakes in the next session here. Uh, and I got a few notes here. Somebody said the uh, resolution is too low to be able to see, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So let's go here to uh, just this first command that's just making my data sets available. And we're going to talk about ways in which we can use Apache Spark to do this unified analytics. I'm giving you this glimpse of the overall big picture before we deep dive next session into the actual data pipelines. So this is a, at a higher level showing how we can go from the data ETL into our actual BI and data science applications. So to start out with, I've got a data set here that just represents flight data by different airlines and different airplanes broken up by year. And initially, they're stored as CSV files. And I want to be able to put these into my data lake. So remember, my data lake is just this repository of data. It's really my staging area in a traditional data warehouse. And I want to bring this in so I can query it in Spark. And remember, Spark is this powerful query engine. So because Spark is a powerful query engine that's divorced from the actual storage format, I can have files that are in a variety of different formats and join them together. And one of our favorite formats, of course, that we're going to be diving into will be the Delta format because of its high performance and transactional guarantees. But for now, let's just start with the CSV file. We could be reading a JSON file to answer the question for some people Vikram had, uh, could we work with semi-structured data? And in fact, Delta can work with hierarchical semi-structured data as well. But let's go here to uh, Command 10. I'm just going to set up a quick database. I'm going to register this CSV file as a table. So I'm going to give it a path to the file. I'm going to say, when I query this table name, what I am actually going to be querying is this file in my data lake. So if this file was to change, the contents of the table is by definition changing because the table is the file. Now somebody asked, what is DBFS? That's a great question here. So DBFS is really a thin layer on top of my blob store. So I could actually, if I wanted to, go in here and put the name of my blob, Databricks-Corp-Training, 
slash ASA slash flights. But then I'd have to go in here and put in my keys and my, my uh, both my regular and my secret key, and I could do an S3 path. What the DBFS does is it tries to create kind of like an HDFS Hadoop abstraction on top of the cloud data store so that I don't have to deal with keys. I simply mount a bucket to a path in DBFS. It's just a, a naming layer on top of S3 so that I don't have to be thinking in terms of S3 buckets themselves with all the credentials associated. I've just mounted the bucket to a path. Uh, it's analogous to HDFS if you've been working with Hadoop's file system on premises, but built for the cloud. It serves the same function. And it's backed by either S3 or Azure Data Lake or Azure Blob Store. So I'm going to take this file and I'm going to make it available as a table. And somebody asked, is this Spark SQL? Yes, we are using Spark SQL right now. So I'm going to create this as a table. We are actually using Spark SQL to do these queries. So I'm going to map this file to a table, and then I'm just going to run a SQL command, select star from airline flight. And at this point, I am literally querying the CSV file. So that CSV file is now accessible to my query engine. And I could see if this year I had a flight, here's when it was scheduled to depart, here's when uh, it was um, actually departed, excuse me, this is when it was scheduled, this is when it actually departed, um, and you could see whether or not it was early or late and so forth. Now, that's my data set. So now let's scroll down a little bit further and actually do something with it. So let's grab another table that's gonna map airplanes, uh, the actual airplane information with models and manufacturers so that I could then start looking at the delays by airplane type. So I'll create a, uh, a data set here that's going to grab the airplane data. And I'll mount this CSV file as well as under a table name using Spark SQL. And so here we can look at by airplane model, how many of them had flight delays? And I could even go a little further using some of the analytics features built into the Dataverse notebook environment. I could come over here and change this to be a pie chart. And we will upload a link to this notebook for those of you who would like to be able to look um, at this notebook offline. This one has not been uploaded to you guys yet. Actually, what I can do is click publish and I will put this into the Slack chat area, but we'll also be uploading it for access after the uh, product is done here. Now, or after the uh, presentation, I should say, is done. This will be part of the available content that we're gonna be uploading. Now, here I've got a nice little pie chart showing me flight delays by year. Now, Keep in mind, right now I'm querying the actual CSV files. So what do we do at this point if, uh, for example, I wanted to merge one CSV file with another as part of my data cleaning process, or in this case, I'm jumping ahead and actually just doing analytics right there on the raw CSV. I didn't even go through the process of loading my data lake with Delta yet, but we are gonna be doing that for scalability reasons. In future sessions, we're gonna be transforming these into Delta for better performance. Now, let's go ahead and run this. So I'm gonna join the first two tables that we looked at, the airplane table and the airline flights table. So now I can look at delays by manufacturer in this particular data set. So I'm able to just use SQL to be doing types of ETL workloads or analytics workloads right there inside of my, lake, my, my data lake. So at this point, I can now come in here and say, you know what, I would like to do, let's see here, another pie chart. I think up before, what I had planned to do was a bar chart. So I'll switch my original one to be a bar chart. And now this one down here, I had planned to make a pie chart. And let me resize it. And we could see flight delays, the number of fl delayed flights by manufacturer. Very nice. Or average departure delay by manufacturer in this data set. 
And what's really cool is this powerful query engine because we are, because Spark is a query engine and not a database itself, we're not locked into a specific storage technology, which is really, really nice. Um, so I could be reading Parquet files, Delta files, CSV files, JSON files, live streaming data from Kafka, and so on. And so, yes, Karam, right now I am doing SQL against the bronze layer directly because we haven't taken the time to build out a silver and a gold layer. So the bronze layer is the raw data, and that's exactly what I'm querying at at this particular stage. Um, we're going to be building the higher layers in the follow-on sessions here. So right now I'm just trying to give like a high-level overview, so we're skipping the silver and gold layers. So at this point, I've been able to query those bronze layers. Now, what else could I do with this? So let's say I've got the data, it's cleansed, and I'm ready to go. At this point, I want to be able to do machine learning. So what's really cool about Spark is that it's not just a query engine. It's able to do a whole variety of distributed workloads. So for example, in this case, I'm going to use Spark to do some machine learning right inside of the same environment. Now, if I want to do machine learning, unfortunately, I have to leave SQL and move to Python because Python tends to be the language of doing data science. A lot of data scientists really like Python. We don't have a good SQL grammar for doing machine learning currently. So I'm going to switch over to using Python, but I just go spark.read.table and I give it my table name. And in this case, I'm just using Python's data frames API to refine the same way I would be doing it in SQL. In fact, I could be writing this in SQL if I really wanted to, this part where I'm doing the data processing. Then I'm going to split it up into a training data set and a test data set, which is typical in data science. You're going to take a sample of the data. Part of the data, you're going to train a machine learning model, but you'll keep some of the data in reserve to then evaluate how good your model is. Because it's one thing for the model to do really well on data it's seen before. It's a whole other thing for the model to do well on data that it never saw when it was being trained. So we reserve a little bit of data so that we can see how it does on data that it never saw before. So we split it up into training and test data. And we build our machine learning pipeline. So in this case, I'm just going to grab the hour of the day. And I'm going to train a linear regression model based on the hour of day to try to predict the departure delay. So I then say, let's build my machine learning model using the training data. Out pops my machine learning model. And then I could take that machine learning model and have it make predictions based on that unseen test data. So this is that data that I held in reserve to be able to figure out how good my model does on data that it's never seen before. And once I've done that, I could take those results and make it available under a table name. In this case, just a temporary view. So I'm writing a machine learning model, training it right now. Just linear regression based on the hour of day. Uh, Prashant uh, asked, what's the recommendation on splitting training data and re um, uh, reserve test data? It really depends on the amount of data that you have. Uh, but it's very important to be testing on data that you've never seen before. Um, the exact amounts that people do, there's a bunch of kind of art to data science in terms of really figuring it out, and it depends on how much data you have. An 80-20 split is a good split if you've got a whole lot of data, but you just want to make sure you have enough test data to make the test worthwhile. But ideally, you'd like to train on as much data as possible. All right, so now that I've done these predictions and made them available under a table name called predictions, I can query that predictions table name. So let's run a query. We're back in SQL land with Spark SQL. And you could see the departure delay was six hours, and I predicted 7.18 hours. Or here, the flight left a little bit early, but I predicted a five-hour delay. Now, what's interesting here is you'll notice that all of the flights that were in the same hour have the same predicted delay. And the reason for that is that the only feature that I trained my model on was the hour of day. I said, let's learn the projected flight delay by hour of day. So in this case, if they're all in the same hour of the day, my very naive model is only using the hour of the day to make predictions. So if they're the same hour, they're going to get the same predictions. 
So let's do a visualization and see how we do. So let's look at the average departure delay and compare it to the average predicted delay using Spark SQL. And now I can come over here, let's make this a line chart and let's compare the actual versus the predicted. And let's look at the area, oh, it's the same because I've already done the averaging. And here we go. You could see that my actual versus predicted on the is quite good. So now keep in mind, the prediction is based off of what I learned in the training data, whereas the actual is based on when I did testing, that test data, what was its actual average delay? So you could see that it's a pretty good match here with one exception. At 2 a.m., the actual and predicted diverged quite a bit. And the reason for that is quite simple. I just didn't have enough data for 2 a.m. So uh, when I did my split between training data and test data, um, I had more anomalies because there just weren't as many data points to average over. And so I just did my machine learning right here inside of the same platform. So this is really, really cool. But what's even cooler is that I could then merge this with streaming data. So in this case, I've got a little simulator that's going to simulate real-time flight delays because I'm not actually hooked up to the airlines to get what their real flight delays are today. Uh, so I'm going to simulate flight information. And what I'm going to do is say, Spark, I want to read streaming data from this directory. So it's as if somebody's writing new CSV files to this directory, or I could be reading it from Kafka. But I'm going to be reading in this data that simulates flight delays. And I want to then turn around, make that available as a table, so that I could do SQL queries not on static data, but on data that's being updated every few seconds. So I'm going to come down here to Command 29, and I'm running Spark SQL at this point. And I'm going to be querying based on data that's being updated every few seconds. And let's do a plot. So here we go. We've got this. Let's switch it over to a uh, line plot. And let's look at the average delay grouped by airline. And you could see this plot. Oh, job stage failure. That's not good. Let's run that one more time. And we should be able to actually see these flight informations be updated in real time. I have seen a number of questions while we're waiting on this. I've seen a number of questions. Uh, will there be a recording of this? Can we download the slides? There will be a follow-up email to this event where you can get access to that information. Or it may be that if you're watching this video not live, but on the recording, then you've already got that information because this recording will be what you're watching later as well. So here, look at this plot. It is updating every few seconds. Live, up-to-date data. Very cool. Now, one thing I do need to remember is that when I'm done, I want to stop my streaming job or it'll keep running indefinitely. The other thing I can do with Spark is I can actually do graph analytics algorithms. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this section, but this is a plot that really shows, in this case, airports and how important an airport is in terms of the number of connections that it helps make using the Google PageRank algorithm. So this is another type of activity that I can do inside of Spark using the GraphFrames API. That's a, an additional library that's available separate from Spark, but very powerful and runs on Spark to be able to do this type of network analysis like PageRank algorithms. Any type of social network where you have nodes like people and edges like connections, in this case, airports and flights. And it's pretty clean, but I would again do this in Python. I would say the, the vertices are going to be the airports, and the edges are going to be my flights. And then I could run the PageRank algorithm, which is named after Larry Page, the founder of Google, and it will actually yield 
which airports are the most important airports in the country. Very interesting data set here. Now, in the interest of time, I'd really like to go and dig into some of the Q&A that you guys have had, but I felt it was important to do a little bit of code beforehand. So hopefully you guys appreciated this little bit of code demo. We will be going much deeper into code in the next three seminars following this. Today's was setting the big picture. We're gonna be almost exclusively in code for the future upcoming seminars. Now, let's take a look at some of the questions that people had. So I'm gonna put up my question slide and then just start reading some questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and just read from the list myself. Um, and yes, we'll provide you a link to this uh, demo as well um, in the, the, the email that we send out. So first one here in terms of the questions um, it says, can we have access to the content used in the seminar? Yes, absolutely. Um, you can have access to this. It'll be part of the emails that we send out. We'll be uploading more content as the series goes on as well. Um, there will be a link that'll take you to the Databricks Academy website and you'll have access to the actual self courses, self-paced courses on which this content is based which is really, really nice perk of attending this webinar. All right, next question. What's the difference between a Delta Lake, a data lake, and that lake house concept? Excuse me, a data lake, a data warehouse, and a lake house. Um, we throw out a bunch of different terms and people are getting a little bit lost in it. So that's a great question. So let's start out with um, the term data warehouse. So the term data warehouse actually has two different meanings and they can be used somewhat interchangeably. There's this concept of data warehousing, which is this concept of how do I go about taking all the data from my different systems and extracting useful insights. And then people have built products that implement that concept of data warehousing. And we usually call this our data warehouse software or our data warehouse platform. Um, and oftentimes people refer to the software as the data warehouse, even though technically data warehousing is a concept. Now, the downside with data warehouse products for the most part has been the amount of work that was required to get the data into the data warehouse before you start extracting any insights. So data lake kind of throws the paradigm on its head. Instead of putting all the upfront work to get the data into the data warehouse before you can start extracting insights. Data Lake says, why don't you just dump the data into a big storage system and then use a powerful query engine like Spark to try to get the insights out later. So the upside is that the barrier to entry is lower. The downside is, is that you're dealing with raw data initially, unprocessed bronze data in this data lake. And that's not very helpful at all. So then what you need is a way to clean that data. And this is where we start getting to this idea of the lake house paradigm. And what the lake house paradigm is about is saying, can I really do data warehousing, but without using a traditional data warehouse product? Can I do data warehousing using my data lake tools? Why would I want to do that? Well, number one, data lakes have the benefit that storage is cheap and I only pay for CPUs when I'm actually running a query. So unlike most data warehouse software that's up and running all the time and you've got the data, like you might have a cluster of 50 machines and each machine's got a subset of the tables on them. Instead of that design, we're gonna store the data out on the blob store and just launch clusters and machines. So we're trying to do data warehousing, but using data lakes. And this approach is really what we mean by the lake house paradigm. And this this new direction that we see the industry going in. And then the third term I used was Delta Lake. And Delta Lake is a very specific product. It is an open source project that implements data lakes and solves a number of the challenges that data lakes have around transactional guarantees and keeping up to date. And that's what we're gonna be exploring in the next two sessions is really how to use Delta Lakes to do these types of data warehousing activities. 
hopefully that clarified that question. So we had data warehouse, it's a concept, data warehouse product, which is the software that we typically buy that's very expensive and not built for the cloud and requires that we have machines up and running whether or not we're using them, which we don't like. So then we go to the data lake, which lets us store the data cheaply, and we only spin up machines when we actually want to run queries. And then we had Delta Lake, which is just a particular technology implementing data lakes that solves a number of really important problems. Somebody else asked, where can I learn more about Spark to be able to use Databricks? Great question. I'm going to forward you to this bit.ly link here. Or you could go to academy.databricks.com, which is what this bit.ly link will take you to. And this takes you to our self-paced training website. So we have a lot of self-paced training courses that you can purchase. If you're a Databricks customer, we are at making a lot of the training available to pay Databricks customers for free. If you're not currently a Databricks customer, um, contact, reach out to a sales rep, or you could simply buy the self-paced training online. Additionally, the content that we're using in this webinar is from our self-paced, and we are making available that subset available to you if you attended this webinar. So the link that you get in the email will make available a subset of our self-paced training. And we just have one request that you not share it with other people. We really want it only for those of you who took time to attend the webinar. But to keep life easy, we're providing a link for you where you can go and get that information. Got another question here, which is, what are your thoughts about creating a hybrid big data infrastructure, part data warehouse, part data lake? Well, that's exactly where we're going and we've been talking about. So eventually, we actually want to get to this world where eventually we want it to be the case that, here, let me go to this picture, I believe. There we go. We eventually want to get to the picture where the data lake could solve all of these lakes where we could be dumping data from the operational data stores and creating this atomic history. The, so there was another question somebody had actually about the difference between the operational data stores. I'll come back to that one. But we'd like to be able to be dumping that history into our data lakes here and eventually even have the data lake serve the refined gold data marts. And this is where the technology needs to mature because data lakes is extremely good for that bronze ingest layer and it's quite good for the silver layer but when it comes to the data marts depending on the size of your data some workloads want to be able to have lower latency than data lakes are currently able to provide so if you are having a latency problem there is some merit to putting that gold layer in a real data warehouse software solution a real data warehouse software solution because it gives you those lower latencies. But we believe that in the next year to two years, the latencies of data warehouses or data lakes are gonna be brought down to be much faster so that you won't even need to use a data warehouse. And that's the paradigm that we're talking about. If you've ever heard the term lake house, it's this vision where where we wanna be in a year or two where you can do data warehousing entirely in a data lake. Now, there's another good question somebody asked. In fact, a few people asked. Um, they said, you know, one of the goals of Hadoop was that you get to keep the data and the compute on the same machine so that the compute has very fast access to the data. And in fact, that's what a traditional data warehouse is doing. You have to bring up a farm of 50 computers or however many computers to host all of the data and those computers are up and running and you're paying for them whether or not you're running queries. And the concern then is, well, how do you get performance if you're storing the data out in Azure Blob Store or in Azure or in Amazon S3 and I have to read it into the computers in order to do these queries. And the way we obtain high performance in those situations is by caching. And when I say caching, I don't mean in-memory caching. What I mean is caching to local disk. So I might have petabytes of data out in the cloud store, and then I can launch on 
Amazon, an i3 instance that has a local SSD drive, or on Azure, the L series instances have local SSD drives, and I can cache the data that I'm reading right now on those SSD drives. So the first time I run a query, it gets cached onto those computers. And if I run a query on the same data set shortly thereafter, the second time, it'll be much faster because I'm reading from local SSD disk. But then let's say I start running a lot of other queries and I start running out of local disk, no big deal, I can evict from that local disk cache and bring in whatever the newest and latest data is. So I get all of the scalability benefits of a big cloud data storage, but all the performance benefits of local computer caching. So this is one of those powerful benefits of data lakes, and it's a big feature of Databricks called the DBIO cache, where we cache the Parquet and Delta Lake files to local SSD as they're being read in. Um, let's see here. Yep, so somebody had asked, would that cause memory issues? Um, Ravi, hopefully that answers your question. There's another question that somebody had asked. They said, um, what exactly is Delta Lake making possible that was very hard before? And somebody else asked another interesting challenge. They said, Amazon S3 has this problem of eventually consistency. So if I do a write and somebody else is doing a read, how do I guarantee that there's not going to be a conflict because S3 is not giving me transactionality? This is exactly where Databricks and Delta are trying to kick in. So Delta adds to the disk a transaction log that says, so when I start writing data, it's going to write it out to new files. And only after the new data is written will it write to the transaction log and say, okay, those old files, they're no longer good. Look at these new files instead. And Databricks has built a locking service that, on top of S3 to make sure that eventual consistency is resolved if you're in the same Databricks workspace. So if you're on Amazon and you're working with S3 and you're in the same workspace, we will provide those ACID properties as part of the implementation of Databricks managing the Delta Lake for you. If you're on Azure, it's even easier because Microsoft Azure has the ability to um, say put if not exists. So I can write a file only if the file is not already there, and that solves the race condition. Uh, on S3, we have our locking service. But the big takeaway here is that what Delta Lake is adding is a transaction log to allow for these consistency and transactional properties, as well as accessing past versions of the data. And you're going to be seeing that in detail in the next few sessions. So uh, Karam just asked, Databricks has kind of two words, Delta Lake and then Lake House or Lake Warehouse. So Delta Lake is an enabling technology, whereas a Lake House is a architectural vision. So just like the term data warehouse was, you know, kind of overloaded to being both the software and the architecture, here we're being very clear. A Lake House is this architectural paradigm where you're using a data lake. Data lake is also an architectural paradigm. Um, Lakehouse is trying to use a data lake to do data warehousing type workloads. A delta lake is a very specific enabling technology. It's an improvement to the parquet file format. So it's a file format and the runtime that knows how to read that file format. That is a delta lake. So it's the technology that adds that little extra delta that improves the other technologies that otherwise would be used for a data lake. Uh, another question that somebody asked here uh, was, let's see here. Oh, somebody had asked about Lambda architecture and they say, how does a data lake reduce the need for Lambda architecture? What exactly was Lambda architecture? So I don't have a good picture on this today, but I'll try to bring one to the, to, uh, the third webinar where we talk about streaming. But basically, the issue is that 
if you are building a data warehouse and you're using batch processing, so you're reading from all these systems, you're populating your operational store, and you're eventually moving that data into a longer term enterprise decision support system, so that's your data lake, there's these nightly batch jobs that people are doing to read and eventually generate these reports. But then the problem becomes that people want to be able to have these reports be updated live. And they don't want to wait for a nightly batch job. So they did the nightly batch job to produce most of the tables. And then they had a streaming solution that dealt with the incremental changes and updated the dashboard since the last batch job. And that's incredibly annoying. It's this little fork here that gives Lambda architecture its name, but it's annoying because you've written all the logic once down here in batch, and then you got to write all the logic again to keep that batch up to date with streaming data. And so you've got duplicate logic and it adds a lot of complexity to your system. Whereas with Delta Lakes, that is that enabling technology that I was talking about, instead, you could simply describe it as a pipeline where I'm constantly appending to this table. And then I have a streaming job that's listening for updates to this table and updating this table. And then listening for updates to that one to update my gold table. So that as new data gets ingested, I'm able to update my gold tables without having to duplicate the logic. I've unified batch and streaming into one pipeline, which is really, really nice. Now, uh, Arafik, or I, I apologize if I can't pronounce your name, Araf, Araf, uh, I apologize, Arafak. Um, he asked, where does the data get stored? Well, depends. If I'm in doing a query, I could say, do the query and save it to a file, or I could say, do a query and show it on the screen. If I'm doing a query and showing it on the screen, then the query result's not stored anywhere. I'm simply running the query and putting it straight onto the screen. If, on the other hand, I want to export the data, then I would run the query and say, write it out to this file. And we'll get a chance to see some of that in the upcoming code examples. Let's see here if there's any other good ones. Ah, there was another question somebody had asked. Um, they said, do I need to convert my JSON file to a Delta file using to or she, in order to be able to use delta lakes so remember my data lake itself could be a hodgepodge of different file formats so my bronze layer i might in fact be importing json files and csv files and a whole bunch of other data sets but in order to read it efficiently i want to a do data cleansing and especially if it's hierarchical JSON, I want to flatten it out to make queries easier to write. I want to try to make my data sets look closer to third normal form and be easier for queries. And that's that idea of the silver layer or the enterprise data warehouse or this atomic enterprise decision support system is where I've cleaned the data up and we really want a faster file format than JSON. So JSON might be appropriate for the bronze layer, but by the time I'm getting to the silver layer, I really want to be using something cleaner. And I would likely use Delta. Some people will even use Delta at the bronze layer because it is so much faster and provides this good integration with streaming. Uh, Krishna asked, once I've gotten into the silver layer, could I then write the results directly out to the, Azure, for example, Azure Data Warehouse or to Snowflake? Absolutely. So I could send my query results and write my query results out to Azure Data Warehouse. I could write it out to Snowflake. I could write it out to disk, or I could simply send it to the individual user directly for display on their screen. That's the beauty of being this powerful query engine that's divorced from storage format is that we can connect to so many different types of systems. Uh, Kriti asked, the CSV files in my demo, were they stored in the data lake? So that was something that I kind of swept under the hood in the demo. Where did those CSV files come from? Uh, when I ran classroom setup, I had mounted this S3 bucket to mount training. So the original CSV files had been in an S3 bucket. With that said, you can also upload files using the data tab, and we'll be doing that in the next seminar.
we'll actually upload files to our data warehouse as part of the next seminar. Um, let's see here. Somebody else had asked, what is the Metastore? So you had seen the Metastore mentioned. So the job of the Metastore is to map table names to the underlying files. And it is really just a database, a SQL database that maps the table names to files. Uh, it's the same Metastore that's typically used by Hive. Um, in terms of Hive being a Hadoop product, mapping, again, files to table names. And you can store all sorts of additional meta information in there, like uh, um, some indexing, column statistics, and other pieces of information that would speed up your queries. But the Metastore is a database that's job it is is to register files as table names. So it's like a, a lookup catalog of what tables exist. So when I click on the data tab, what I'm really seeing here is a view of the Metastore that shows me what files I had uploaded and where they are. And then I could even go and say, for example, airline flight, I could query the Metastore by saying, describe extended airline flight. And it's gonna go out to the Metastore and say, tell me about this table, please. And now there are over 103 questions. So I'm afraid I may not be seeing all the really good ones anymore. Um, so if the silver and bronze concept is not clear, we will be making it more clear with a practical example in the next two webinars. So I would really encourage you to tune in. Just think of bronze is where I load the data, silver is where I keep my cleaned up data, and gold is where I put my aggregate reports. Um, somebody correctly observed that you could call them your load table, then your enterprise data warehouse, and then your gold ones would be your data marts. That would be completely accurate. Um, the bronze, silver, gold simply implies this progression. You can use them interchangeably. Um, I actually like calling it my raw layer, my query layer, and my reporting layer or my data mart. Let's see here, up there we go. Describe airline flights kicked in. I could see, okay, there is this table, but if I go further down, here we go, detailed table information. It says it's an external table that is a CSV file located here. So that's the job of the Metastore is to help provide that mapping information. It's just an implementation detail of Spark. Let's see if I spot any other good questions. We're almost out of time here. Um, that was a good question. Somebody said, why isn't Delta Lake part of Apache Spark? Why is it a separate open source project? And the answer to that question is that it's really a best practice to try to keep your, your open source project narrowly tailored. So there's the Apache Spark open source project that focuses on the core engine, and then modules that extend this Apache Spark to do various types of work, like in this case, good data lakes, um, and eventually the lake house concept. It makes sense to have that be a different project so that um, A, they can be mixed and matched. We, for example, we want other vendors that aren't using Spark to still be able to read the Delta Lake file format. And they're able to do so because Delta Lake is open sourced. And this is one of the ways in which we really wanna make sure that you always have access to your data, even if you change the technology stack. That's that concept of low data gravity. Uh, somebody else said, okay, so Delta Lake was this concept uh, how much of it can we achieve today? So we can actually achieve quite a bit today. What's missing in the, the, the uh, full data lake vision, data lake house vision, I should say, um, is that low latency query. And so there's gonna be a lot of work being done in the next two years to really reduce the latency required to do interactive queries. So if you are a BI user, doing interactive queries, you don't want to wait 20 seconds for a query result. 
you want to start getting query results immediately. How can we reduce the latency of a query? Um, so there's a lot of work to be done there because the latency of a data warehouse for those interactive queries is much faster currently. Like it's a lot shorter of a latency. Um, but the data lake scales and is so much cheaper because I don't have to keep as many machines running to host all the data because it's out in the cloud data store. Um, so I would say a huge amount you can actually do today, but we've deliberately called this training seminar series cloud data platform rather than how to build a lake house because we don't want to confuse people with the new stuff that'll be coming out to really implement the lake house pattern in the next year or two so right now we're building a cloud data platform using databricks and it implements a lot of this idea that we're going to be doing in fact we are going to be building a cloud data platform in the next two webinars, and then we're going to be using it to do machine learning and business intelligence in the last webinar. And it is now, uh, we're coming up on the two hour mark. Um, does anybody want to ask the last question? Ah, I like Talib's question here. What's the cost difference between a Delta Lake and a data warehouse software solution? So with a Delta Lake, or really any data lake, you don't pay, you pay for the disk, but you don't pay if you're not actively running queries. You bring up the, like, that is to say, you bring up the cluster when you want to run queries, and then you can shut it back down again, which saves you a lot of money. You're only paying when you're actually doing the work, as opposed to having to pay just to have the data hosted. And this is a huge cost savings because I get to take advantage of this cheap cloud data storage. Um, now, the question may be more of a tangible, like what's the dollar and cents difference? That very much depends on what you're paying now for your data warehouse. Um, with Databricks, you're paying a few dollars an hour to have a machine up and running answering queries. Like uh, you pay what we call per DBU and you can get the pricing on the Databricks website but you're basically paying for the EC2 machine and the Databricks software uh, while it's up, but then you shut down your cluster and you can run it nightly, much faster, and huge cost savings. All right, so with that in mind, I'm gonna thank everybody for attending. I wish I could have answered everybody's questions here. I got like 120 questions, so I apologize if I didn't get to your question. Please do come back to tomorrow's session. I really look forward to having you. Uh, also, there'll be a feedback survey as part of the follow-up email. We love feedback. The company likes to get 90% feedback ratings, like in terms of 90% participation, letting us know what we're doing well, what we need to change. How did you like the Q&A? How can we make this better? Please click on the feedback link in the email. That'll really help us plan these sessions. Thanks again, everybody, and enjoy your week.